Welcome, my name is Katie Atutuppin and I'm excited to he be here at the Schomburg Center with Dr. Imani Perry. We are currently inside of the American Negro Theater, which was founded in 1940 to host lesbians, black lesbians, including Ossie Davis and Harry Belafonte. So we're in this uh, historic place having a great and historic conversation about the Black National Anthem, also known as Lift Every Voice. And we're actually gonna play a clip for you right now. How are you? I'm great. It's wonderful to be here. I'm excited you're here. Um, I love this song. I think most black people love this song. Uh, if not, they ought to. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if not love it, they know it. Yes. Right. They definitely know it. Indeed. Do you want... Sorry. Okay. And so I, I actually want to start by asking you, one, do you know all the words to Lift Every Voice? I do. Oh, my goodness. I know all of the words, um, and I knew all of the words before I started uh, working on the book, mm -hmm. um, I think because I just feel such a deep attachment to the song, which, of course, is part of why I was called specifically to write this book, yes. knowing you, your, your scholarly life is often driven by your passions. Yes. So, um, and are we going to hold for the, the song? And we're going to play the song right okay. now. All right. Sorry, I thought there was a question. <laughs> we're good. It was like a voice to men version. So I hope you enjoyed that clip of the song. And like I said, we're here with Dr. Aman Amani Perry talking about her newest work, May We Forever Stand, a history of the Black National Anthem. And so I'm curious, and I'm, I'm pretty certain a lot of our viewers are curious, what inspired you to write this book? Well, um, you know, there's lots of reasons, lots of inspirations, but there's a story that I tell at the beginning of the book that um, in some ways was the call that made me know that I had to write the book. Um, when my son, my older son was five years old, he came home singing the song one day and I was shocked because he hadn't been in the kind of sort of the ritual kind of black institutional life that I had. So I just didn't anticipate that he would know the song. And I said, do you know what that song is? And he said, yeah, it's the black national anthem. And he just kept going on about his business. And I said, where'd you learn it? And he tells me, he learned it at school, and he goes to, you know, it was at a predominantly white um, private school, and so I was surprised. But they were sort of teaching it as part of the diversification of curriculum. So mm. we went home to my family in Alabama for uh, Thanksgiving, which we usually do, and I asked him, why don't you stand up and, you know, show everybody the song that you've been learning? Um, and so he did, and he began to sing, and my entire family stood up with him and raised their fists and began to sing um, alongside him. And his eyes were like saucers, and he was just um, overwhelmed. And for me, um, you know, it was one of those moments where I said, telling the kind of, the story of the song, but also the institutional history, the social meaning, the, um, the emotional and political mm. meaning of the song, is really important. This is a part of our history that merits kind of deep understanding. Um, and I saw space that, that needed to be filled um, in, in, in our body of knowledge. And so, you know, I knew I had to write it. Wow. 
And you you brought up because I my first interaction with the song. I grew up in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. I listened to the song. We learned it in elementary school. We sang mm-hmm. it at the beginning of every day. Um, oh, and wonderful. I went right. It's amazing. Yeah. And I went years without hearing this song until I ended up at a Howard Homecoming mm-hmm. <laughs> <you know, laughs> yes. step show. And everyone just rose up from their seats, put their fists in the air, and mm-hmm. started singing that song. And I just remember being taken aback by the beauty of that moment, like yes. a shared moment with all of these people who were rel- just relatively strangers, but it united us in that moment. Yes. So I think about, you know, when you said the curricula that your son's school was doing, like this is a part of the curriculum. This was a part of a project yes. or a, an institutional attempt mm-hmm. to teach black people and black children in particular, in particular. Yes. about their history. Can you tell more, tell us more about that project? Sure. I mean, and I, um, this is mostly what the second chapter is devoted to, and it's called School Bell Song. So um, the authors of the song, James Alden Johnson, the two brothers, James Alden mm-hmm. Johnson, who's the lyricist, Rosamond Johnson is um, as the composer. They are from Jacksonville, Florida. They have parents who are Bahamian and Virginian. Um, and they have they are these sort of classic race men. They have an extraordinary education in, in the late 19th century, and they return home to Jacksonville to become educators. And that was common for people who have for, had black people had formal education mm-hmm. to become teachers. And there's you know, there's a whole piece about the drive for education is huge in the late 19th century um, and the black community. So it starts out as a song for children. Um, written for children for a celebration of um, Abraham Lincoln's birthday, but then it becomes really this epic story about black life on these shores. Um, And it is quickly brought into um, black educational institutions where, like you describe your experience, kids are singing it every morning or once a week in this ritual fashion. And I think that's really important, one, because it's telling children, especially in the context of segregation, context of Jim Crow, context of a white supremacist national order, that not only is your history important, right, people who are told they have no history, right, is your history important, but we're going to tell it in beautiful epic terms with this gorgeous composition and irrespective of the environment you're in, right, like so you could be in living in abject poverty, gym, you know, uh, uh, plantation economy, and this is your story, right? Um, and it was, a, it was encased, you know, it was, it was embedded in a really deliberate, as you said, project um, to cultivate black children. So to me, part of the story of the song and the institutions around it is what, what created black children who could lead the civil rights revolution, right? That's part of the backdrop. And so you see... There are both, you know, there's a national black PTA in the early 20th yes. century. There's national black teachers organizations. There are local branches. Many of the state branches of black teachers associations, they're begun in like the 1870s, 1880s. They're talking about best practices, curricula development. They're, and, and this is also really important to me personally is that Every prominent black intellectual that you can think of in the early 20th century is involved in the education of children. Yes. They're taught they're in te- those organizations. They're meeting with, with, the, um, with teachers who teach in rural areas, but also the very distinguished, you know, prominent black high schools like the Dunbar School in Washington, D.C. And so there is this collective project to think about what do these kids need? knowing the limitations that the society has, but that we want our children to imagine more. Yes. Yeah. And we we continue that legacy even here at the Schomburg Center. I mean, you referenced uh, Toro Schomburg in this yes. book and yes. the Schomburg Center yes. as places beyond, you know, these schools that were collecting information about black people, telling our stories from ourselves. Yes. And we continue that legacy down into our, our junior scholars program mm-hmm. and our teen curators program. Mm-hmm. And so we see the value of this on the not only the the collective you know community around Black people, but also the minds that that we're cultivating. And you you included like the term race creating race men and race women. And yes. I 
I, I didn't realize it until, you know, a couple of days after reading your book, like my teachers, you know, cultivated me to be a race woman, a race man, of someone who is critically aware and thinking about how we talk about race, who we are as black mm-hmm. people, how do we dispel stereotypes? How do we tell authentic stories about ourselves? Yes. And that was all done through a song? Right. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. What? So I'm so curious. So I'm curious even about the title. You know, I always called it the Black National Anthem. Right. And reading your book, it's it has so many different titles. Right. Right. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, which one is appropriate? Um, so there's Lift Every Voice. There's the Black Negro Anthem. Yeah. How there's the Negro National Hymn. The yeah. A Negro National, National Hymn. Anthem. Yes. Yes. All the and 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 in the midst of those different designations are different political moments and conflicts around the song. Right. So. You know, so when, you know, the NAACP adopts it as its official song um, in 1920, and part of that is actually, um, it's a sign of the NAACP actually shifting to becoming a black organization. So prior to that, it, it was, you know, it was a multiracial organization with lots of um, kind of liberal white people in the leadership. And what James Weldon Johnson, because by then he's working for the NAACP, yes. he and Du Bois, who was the W.B. Du Bois, who's the editor of The Crisis, together they decide they're going to build up the black, the infrastructure of the NAACP by starting local chapters in the South. And so, and so they've done that through the 19 teens, the late 19 teens. Mm-hmm. So by adopting the song as their official song, it's a way of saying look, we have the same song as Black America has as opposed to the other way around, right? Um, and so it's a, you know, it's a way of asserting. So one of the things that's important to me is that it really is communities of Black people who adopt it as an anthem. It's yes. not projected onto. It happens in a remarkable kind of organic way. Um, but people do have debates, you know? So there, there are people, the NAACP does not say that it is, they don't refer to it as as the Negro National Anthem because they take the position ultimately that there can be only one national anthem and we're arguing for inclusion mm. politically. So we're not going to have, there's, you know, debates in, in various black newspapers about whether we should have an anthem. And some are saying, well, it's ridiculous to have an anthem. Black people are disempowered all over the world. Why would we have an anthem? You know, so... There's some, pa- but the reality, and the reality is that most of that happens amongst intellectuals. <laughs> For regular folks, say this is our anthem, and based upon the moment in history, right? So once you get to the late '60s, that transition to the Black National Anthem as opposed to the Negro National Anthem is important yes. because the song comes along with the political moment. And so it becomes. So one thing I was, we were yeah. talking about earlier before you all joined us uh, was the idea that even if in reading the lyrics, if you do not call it, you know, the black national anthem, there's no, technically no reference to a people, a race yes. or a gender of people. It's just a people, right? Yes. So it's, it's open for interpretation. It is. And yet it's, and yet it's very clear, <laughs> it's very clear. clear to black communities that this is our song. Yes. So I'm curious to think about how early founder, early intellectuals, black intellectuals, position themselves as an international, you know, blackness yes. and not just an American experience of right. blackness. Yes. And I think this is really important because the song does not mention a particular nation state. And I, I, I think too. It's, yes. yeah, and it's, it's important because if we think about the context, 1900, right? Um, so slavery has ended, colonialism is ramping up. There's really virtually no independent black mm. nations there's haiti and liberia and they're both in some ways not fully and you know i'm liberian yeah. so i know yeah <laughs> right. and so um this question for black people all over the globe is you know what what do we have to do with this concept mm-hmm. of the nation state how are we going to find our freedom and what's important is that the Johnson brothers and lots of their peers, black intellectuals in the United States and also in, in various countries, are really grappling with this, but they also have an expansive imagination about who, what, to what, to where and what do we belong, right? And yes. so there's an openness. And so one of the things that I'm really invested in, in that invested in as a scholar is recuperating the history of black internationalism 
and the kind of political imagination that existed in the early 20th century. And the song is really reflective of that, so that even though it's not really picked up very frequently in other nations, it gives space to imagining a black world that isn't necessarily just bound to the United States, but, you know, all kinds of possibilities for the future, right? So that there are times before Marcus Garvey chooses um, Ethiopia, land of our fathers, where he he opens his speeches um, with lift every voice and makes reference to it, right? So there's, you know, very different political organizations, you know, black socialists, black communists, you know, you you know, (laughs) Garveyists, you know, they all embrace the song. And how, so for, for a young person listening mm-hmm. to the song now, um, I'm trying to think, position it in our current political moment, yeah. right? What t- type of impact do you think this song can have on a young black kid growing up right. right now? So it's tricky. So I'll say on the one hand, and I really try not to end the book on a pessimistic note because I always <laughs> try. Uh, on the one hand, one of the things that is really um important to understand is, you know, our kids are less likely to sing the song or learn the song in part because we don't have the same kind of institutional and associational life. And that's not just black Americans, that's Americans generally. Americans are not um, joiners in the way they once were. Mm. They don't have, you know, tightly networked communities in the way they once did. And so the institutional structures that were present pre-desegregation, that were a matter of course in black life, are not there in quite the same way. So we still have schools that are all black, but they're not black institutions, for example, right? That's a very part, right? clear distinction. <laughs> That's an important distinction. Yeah. So, so it doesn't have the same function, but I do think that there's a lot we can learn from the past about how to put the song into the lives of young people. So if we look at, you know, I I read about curricula of teachers and the way they use the song to teach vocabulary, the way they use to teach history, the way that they created pageants around the song. And and I think one of the things that's really, for me, was also, just to go back to the previous point, was really exciting is that when they would teach the song in the context of teaching black history, they taught global black history Hmm. in the early 20th century. And we, we're, we're not there now right um so they're you know so um you know teaching about the caribbean they're teaching about um ancient africa all those sorts of and so i think that our job today is to think about you know how do we teach a song but how do we also encase it in something that gives kids not just a larger perspective but a sense of of history and also a yearning for learning more right that so it's an entry point in the way that it was historically that's my absolutely yeah. and I, I that's one of the, the things I appreciate about your work mm-hmm. in this book it's it's an entry point mm-hmm. it's not supposed to be a destination yeah. you don't the students are are singing the song or people black yes. people in this time are singing the song to start off a ceremony or to end a ceremony yes, right. right they're analyzing it in their school environments it is always a a an approach to teaching yes. and I appreciate that as like as an educator, you yeah. can use this in your curriculum mm-hmm. and that these thinkers, W.E.B., uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, yes. all of these people oh. were thinking about this so early on. How are we going to teach black kids? Yes. Children in particular. Yes. It was very clear <laughs> from what I've been reading yes, that, that, was that we really want to thing. teach black kids so mm-hmm. that they can grow up and, you know, impact. So you move in the book from the new Negroes and that, you know, reconstruction yes. yeah, and yeah. all of the the encasings of violence and how do you keep yourself, um, you know, how do you feel proud of yourself and feel human Mm -hmm. in a time where so much inferiority was surrounding you, not just politically, but socially and economically. Economically, Right. And, And then you go into the civil rights era, like this new Negro era gives birth to this civil rights era. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you talk more about those two eras and how they interact through this song? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that, I try to do at the beginning is so the period in which the song is written 1900 is often is referred to as and it comes from um, the historian Rayford Logan as the nadir of American race relations the worst time right lynching Jim Crow convict leasing all this stuff and so one of the things I, I say okay that's true and yet this is this incredible period of creativity for black folks building all of these institutions, right? Um, institutions, organizations, schools, I mean, all these things. Right? Yeah, I was so, I was blown away by it's the amazing. amount of schools that were able to go up during yeah. that time and so much violence. Right, yeah. and, and and the use of sweat equity, because you talk, we're talking about people 
who are poor. <laughs> yes. Right? And so using every form of labor possible to build. So it's incredibly inspiring, but it also, I think, is important to understand the foundation of the movement, right? So there is the larger society turns its back on black folks. We're going to let them do Jim Crow in the South. We don't care, right? And black people turn inward and build. Yes. And then so when you get to 1961 um, and you get, you know, you're, you, you're exper- you're, you have um, college students engaging in sit-ins. I mean, we could go, we could actually do, you know, 56, the Montgomery bus boycott. But in all of these moments, one of the things that I think is really important is you either see the presence of Lift Every Voice and Sing or you see uh, the presence of Lift Every Voice and Sing along with um, the sort of act actions happening during the time when black when negro history week which becomes black history month was traditionally celebrated mm. so to me that's an indication that the work these teachers had been doing in celebrating negro history week and having them sing these songs becomes a direct inspiration for political organizing in the movement right it's not an accident when these yes. things happen yes. at certain times of the year um now, there's a transition away from Lift Every Voice and saying when the movement gets larger, but it certainly is part of the foundation for people eventually saying, okay, enough, now we're going to push back against the larger society. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't want to give any spoilers, but what yeah. you were just speaking to brings me back to a point in, your, in the text where you're discussing Maya Angelou's uh, oh, graduation yeah. And the story, and I would love for you to share that story yes. with everyone because it speaks to, you know, that generation's, you know, being confronted with white supremacy and the mm-hmm. violence of white supremacy and still being able to stand up and push back against it and keep your dignity at the same time. Yes. So, I mean, and, um, I love that example because many of, many people read, I know why the cage bird sings yes. and it's a, and, and in the memoir and the memoir is so beautiful because um, it captures, you know, the depth and cruelty of segregation, but also the incredible beauty of black communities. And so she she details her eighth grade graduation, um, and the way that she details it kind of captures what I talk about in the book as black formalism, like these kind of formal rituals that existed and, and have continued to exist in some um, spaces of black formal behavior, right, ritual yes. behavior. And so the graduation ceremony has all of these preparations, and it's so beautiful, and the valedictorian is going to give this wonderful speech. Um, and it's in Stamps, uh, Arkansas. And a local white official comes in and disrupts the graduation ceremony and gives a speech that is completely um, insulting and diminishing. And she describes how he sucks the energy out of the room and then her peer, who is the valedictorian, has to follow that by giving his speech. And, and this young man makes this in, incredible decision um, to he's delivering his speech, but then he, he morphs into singing or just speaking and then lift every voice and sing. And it shifts the energy of the room. And it's this moment where you see the work that the song did, right? that it confronted white supremacy. Right, in its face, and so, um, and and, uh, and it change it rest- it recuperates the beauty yes. of the moment. Right, um, and there's so many moments like that. You know, I was reading memoirs. I was reading. Uh, I was reading actual like paperwork of graduation ceremonies throughout wow. the great <laughs> stuff. I was reading school curriculum. And, you know, there's so many moments like that in the history, and so I just love that one because it captures. You know, she's just she's such an amazing writer. It captures it so so beautifully. Yes. And you, so you brought up one thing I've been trying to wrap my head around. I, I'm, I swear to you, I read this section about like five times uh-huh. <laughs> until I was like, I got it. I think I got it. I got okay. it. I'm going to ask Samani Perry and I'm going to get it. Um, so you, you briefly mentioned it, but formalism, black yes. formalism. And there's a conversation in the text where you're just like, well, a lot of people will assume that we perform these songs in very serious occasions or special occasions where, you know, you'll probably wear a suit and tie and a dress and it'll be formal on stage. That's usually how we did it when I was growing up. You wore your uniform, you got on stage, you sang in front of the entire audience. Yes. (laughs) And that's how you knew it was serious. Pageantry, yes. Exactly. It It was pageantry, absolutely. And it's so curious because... 
I feel like in today's day and age, if you were to write a think piece on it, someone would be like, well, this is respectability politics, right? Yeah. This is, we have, why do we have to perform it in this way for it to be considered special or ritual? Why yeah. do we have to seem so respectable in this way or perform it, like I said? I'm, and I'm just like, you're pushing back and saying, whoa, 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 right. let's not mistake the two. Right. So can you, let's, I want to, I want to go with you <laughs> at that one. I think this is really <laughs> important because what, you know, in her very carefully detailed research of um, uh, Black Baptist organizations, Evelyn Brooks thinking about them, talks about the politics of respectability, and she borrows this from discord, from conversations about um kind of Irish forms, Irish assimilation, where she mm. talks about this idea that women, that women in these organizations had that if you, that part of the way to achieve racial justice was to present a middle class respectable face to the larger society by adopting white middle class forms of performance mm. and behavior. Um, and it's, and you know, she, she shows this in documents and the like, but Black formalism is different. Sometimes there's an overlap, but it's really what I'm talking about, what black people do for black people, mm. right? Within our communities, that's about uh, uh, an expression of self-respect and self-regard and also the importance of ritual, which is something that's really important in sort of in, in African and African diasporic cultures, period, right? So, that, so, so there's both um, the specific in, in the context of the United States, but it's also just, I mean, it's, it's part of this sort of, all these cultural forms. And so when I, so I think it's, it's an important distinction because it is not the same thing to want to be respectable in order to be appreciated by the larger society as to say there's, there are notions of what's appropriate. There's times and places. Yes. For you sound like my mom. Things. There's right. a time and a place for right. everything. So that it's not that, the people who engage in formalism weren't also at the juke joint on Friday night. It's just that's there's a time and place for certain types of behavior, and certain types of dress. Yes. And, I, and I think you know, to me that's really. And I just one more thing related is that uh, in academia we've been really, really good at talking about kind of vernacular forms. Mm. Um, and I've I've done it too. That I think you know, like I wrote about hip hop. I think talking about the vernacular is important. Like you know, the every you know the kind of informal life. But we haven't, we've sort of missed the boat in understanding the formal. And one does, one never exists without the other. Yes. Right? There's, you don't have communities that don't also have, if you have the informal and you have the everyday, you know, the relaxed, there's always the counterpart. And so I think we got to start to fill that gap. Absolutely. And I, I, those are the types of things we bring into, especially the Junior Scholars Program here yeah. at the Schomburg Center. We like to approach it from both ways. Mm hmm and simply because it means you invite more black people, more people who are very different into the space yes. instead of like having anyone having to feel the need to assimilate or conform. Yeah. You invite more people. You have more experiences. You learn more. Yes. And that's why I think I appreciate um, learning that James and his brother, like they traveled, they studied in London, they learned classical music, yes. they loved jazz like in the blues mm -hmm. it was like you it's not one or the other no. you can enjoy both yes. and so some of my students will ask when we think of of topics of uh formalism and politics of respectability students will say um and they still say this i've gotten to the point where i get exhausted but like if i speak a certain way my friends will say i'm speaking white right. or mm -hmm. if i act a certain way people are going to assume i'm acting white mm -hmm. and then they come here and i'm just like you're just you and you're in this space right. and you get to enjoy that and right. be celebrated for it mm -hmm. and not be judged. So I pre that's just a, me saying, hey, girl, I appreciate you for that. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> And I, I would just say also, too, that, I mean, one of the things that, you know, I, I love the Schomburg Center with, like, every fi fiber of my being. And part of it is because given that we now don't have that many um, kind of institutional and associational forms, it's 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 all the more important, mm. you know, that there is the young scholars program and there are, and there's also the fellows program yes. and there's also, it's a community resource and people come in a regular fashion to like, exhibitions and events. And it's also a source of re you know, I've spent many, many hours here as a yes. researcher right? <laughs> that, you know, it really is the continuation of this tradition when there's not that many spaces that, function that way anymore it's very precious mm. so, so how do you see us i mean i've read 
many texts, especially within the past year. I mean, I was just speaking to you about democracy in black yes. and, and there's a, there is a decline in these, these types of spaces. Mm -hmm. I have parents and students and educators coming to us here saying, how do we replicate this? in other places. So if you were to give advice to an educator or, yes. or someone in academia or just a community organizer and how do we, how do we begin to reinforce or rebuild these yeah. institutions and these communities? I, you know, I think that, um, one of the things that, that, uh, is hard in this hyper media digitally focused world is that we, we think things happen quickly and even the way we narrate history, hmm is as though things happen spontaneously and quickly. And so I think actually studying models carefully demonstrates the kind of commitment and time it takes to build an institution and to get the kind of community buy-in and to kind and and also having people that will sustain a commitment over a long period of time. I think that's that's almost the most important key. I mean one of the things I used to say when I first um, I graduated from college in 1994 and everybody wanted to start a school. <laughs> and so, and most of them, you know, within five years, we're done with that, right? Like, you know, and it, I don't mean to sort no, of I know tear what people you mean. down, but it's like, because we hadn't learned how long it takes to build anything, you know, and that's also true for scholars. Like anything that's worth doing, um, it probably will require, you know, decades of your life. Yes. Right. And so for so for for an institution like this, people can come in and out because it has a firm foundation. But someone wanting to replicate it really will require someone really wanting to expend decades building something. Absolutely. Found, yeah. And that's why we exist. That's where we're here yes. at the Schomburg Center, yes. <laughs> because this is the foundation where we start to build. Yeah. Yes. And how much of your research did you do here? Um. So. I did. I'm not um, putting you on the spot. I'm no, not. No, I, so I, did a, I did a fair amount here for this book, but for my book that's coming out in September, uh, on that is on Lorraine Hansberry, I was here for weeks and weeks and weeks. I have long, have a, lots of hotel bills <laughs> um, because you all have the Lorraine Hansberry papers. Yes. Um, yeah, but I did. I, so um, there are newspapers that you all have that. No other institution has, though, for this book that I used um, uh, in order to find like graduation programs and things like that, or photographs of. They're, pho they're not a lot of photographs in the book, but I used photographs to sort of get a sense of what like May Day celebrations were like or graduation ceremonies, how they looked, so that I could sort of describe them more fully um, in the early 20th century. That's excellent. Well, I yeah. look forward to reading your work on Lorraine Hansberry. Weekends ago, I spent a time in the archives, just going through her, her archives and the collection. She is so dynamic yeah, and entertaining. Amazing. I don't know. I was entertained. It was yes. odd, but uh, well, she's hilarious. She's so, hilarious. Yeah. That's yeah. why I was so entertained. So I'm looking forward to that work and I know Thank everyone else you. will too. Thank, Thank you for being here. Everyone, Thank you for having Amani Perry, Dr. Amani Perry, May We Forever Stand, the history of the Black National Anthem. Get your copy now. I know I got mine. Yes. <laughs>